Scripture reminds us that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the great glory of God, but that there is mercy for those who call on the name of the Lord. So trusting in God's grace, God's love, and mercy for us, let us confess our sins before God and our neighbor. God, our maker, we confess that we are not ready to meet you. You offer us a place in your house, yet we find no room our lives. You invite us into your eternal realm, yet we fail to welcome others. Forgive us, God of grace. Let your word of life be with us, that we may truly believe that nothing is impossible with you. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, now hear our silent personal prayers.
children come down. Parents who are here today, uh, this sermon should come with a spoiler alert. Uh, and if you are concerned about that, I invite you to uh, invite your children to uh, head back to 
chapel. Um, <clears throat> if you get my drift, I hope you understand what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, if you want to turn to nearpod.com, if you have your devices uh, available, um, the code this morning is F as in fa la 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 la, H as in ho ho ho, C as in Christmas, P as in present, and R as in Rudolph. How do you like that? F, H, C, P, R is the code. So about six centuries before the birth of Christ, the prophet Isaiah uh, gave this poetic oracle that we read, that Sam read for us this morning. And then after the advent of Christ and his death and burial and resurrection, as Christians were looking at these words, they wondered. Could it be that these words were spoken about the Christ? Now, as we turn to Matthew chapter 2, we read a story that is only in Matthew, the story of the Magi and all of the gifts that they bring to the Christ. Let's listen for the word of the Lord. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born king of the Jews? For we have observed his star at its rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. And calling together all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. And they told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet. And you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men, and learned from them the exact time that the star had appeared. And then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I also may go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. And when they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. Then, opening their treasure chests, they offered him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they left for their own country by another road. This is the word of the Lord. During this Advent season, we've been looking at the classic uh, TV Christmas specials from the 60s. Specials that were very special to me because it was the only time I got to watch TV as a child. We've seen to a greater and lesser degree that in each of these so-called secular stories, there is a reflection, sometimes muted, sometimes distorted, but a reflection of the real story and meaning of Christmas. So today we come to the 1970s animated classic Santa Claus is Coming to Town, directed by Jules Bass and Arthur Rankin Jr., narrated by Fred Astaire and with Mickey Rooney as Santa, or Chris, as he's called. We'll say a bit more about that gift giver extraordinaire, but First, we need to say something about the biggest hurdle that we face in hearing the Christmas story in this particular Christmas classic. Let's just say that gift giving has become for many of us 
the least true aspect of Christmas as it is celebrated today. The way we give and receive gifts may seem to us more a chore and a duty than a grace, or worse, a compulsion or an addiction. Most of us have been programmed since early childhood, and those stories of Santa Claus really helped in this, with a gut-level understanding that Christmas is all about stuff. Stuff under the tree, stuff we give to others, stuff we beg, stuff we hand out at the office, stuff we collect, and stuff that by Easter is discarded. As Anna Quinlan put it so perceptively in a Newsweek article, stuff is not salvation. Her conclusion is that we have an addiction to consumption that is all out of control and that it qualifies as a sickness. So how do we redeem that? Is there some meaning in gift giving and gift receiving that's a bit more sane? A bit less desperate, a bit, a bit less of an addiction. And the gifts of Christmas, can they be more than just stuff? And can the true meaning of gift giving and receiving really shine through? Once again this morning, our story has the usual stock characters. The unreformed and evil lawmaker and enforcer named Mr. Burgermeister Meisterberg who is, by the way, our King Herod, or Scrooge. And quickly, are also the quickly reformed and warmed winter warlord. And there is our omniscient narrator, the postman, Mr. Kluger, special delivery Kluger, who claims to explain everything that we need to know about the big fat man in the bright red suit over the course of about 48 minutes. Y'all have got time, right? Oh, 
line of words. Very God of very God begotten not nay, came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Ghost and the Virgin Mary. That story was the center of Nicholas's life. And the gifts that he gave weren't just gifts. They weren't just so much stuff. They were a response of praise and gratitude and worship at the birth of the king. If you'll forgive a really bad pun, Santa's cause is something profound. And that's what Mr. Kluger would have discovered if he had inquired about the name on that little medallion. In time, St. Nicholas of Mira became one of the most beloved saints in medieval and Renaissance Europe. Every culture would have its own distinct way of customizing and embellishing and localizing the tradition, and eventually, of course, those traditions hopped the pond. They blended together, they were pureed and dumped into this melting pot of a young republic. Most of what we associate with Santa is because of an Episcopal pastor, an Old Testament professor here to my heart, Clement Moore, who wrote a whimsical little poem for kids in 1822, borrowing heavily from Washington Irving and published in Lady Christmas, was the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature you knew before. Moore was the first to suggest a poem, Santa, made more iconic, of course, by the Coca-Cola marketing machine. And then, of course, there's the Rankin and Bass TV special. Now, admittedly, by the time you get to 1970 and this Christmas special, <laughs> the connection to the fourth century bishop has faded. But are we to reject Santa entirely? John Calvin, <laughs> you knew I was going, who, by the way, <laughs> uh, yeah, wanted to ban Christmas altogether. One of the few places where I disagree totally with Catherine, by the way. He'd be quick to say, even he would be quick to say, that God is able to proclaim his glory anywhere at any time using even the most recalcitrant of vessels. And if the most glorious moment of God's way with humankind is in Christ, then we will inevitably find this Christ right there even in our secular celebration of Christmas, just behind and in the middle of all the rather silly things that we as people do, which makes it a joy to discover that a bishop named Nicholas is still the one who carries that message, carries it right in the middle of a story about elves and warlocks and magic snow globes and all the rest. You see, red is the color of that old bishop's robe. He's there in the Dutch version with wooden shoes and white horse. He becomes Santa Claus when he arrives in New Amsterdam. He's there in Chris Kringle, another anglicized mispronunciation of Chris Kringle, the Christ child. And this was, of course, Luther's brilliant attempt to replace St. Nicholas, you know, those reformers, no saints, no saints, whatever, with a child who brings gifts like the little drummer. So even the Chris Kringle gets lumped into the Santa Claus tradition, as did the English Protestant Father Christmas with his long white beard, and the Scandinavian elf and reindeer, and the German Pelis Nicole with his sleigh powered by lightning, thunder, and blitzen. We could complain about this secularization of Christmas, but is it really secular? I think that Santa's wing is St. Nicholas having the last laugh at the irony that in every mall and commercial outlet in the USA, a 4th century bishop of the church is sitting on his bishop's throne right there, either barely hidden or blatantly obvious to anybody who has eyes to see. And every avenue, even 5th Avenue in New York, leads right back to Nero. Which means that whether people know it or not, when they give gifts at Christmas time, they are really continuing a tr tradition that goes straight back to St. Nicholas and beyond him to the Magi, who come to pay a king 
college. As John Buchanan wrote, the funny thing about our culture's obsession with Christmas is that it wouldn't happen at all if it remained an obscure and pure Christian holiday like Epiphany or Pentecost or Ash Wednesday. But without much intending to, the whole world will stop today and tonight and tomorrow to hear a story repeated that they already know deep in their heart in hundreds and even thousands of languages, the story of God's vulnerability, the story of God's love and God's presence in the life even of the most human. And right here in the middle of unwrapped presence, every gift will echo the gift that started the whole world giving.
Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right. God, we watch and we wait for the coming of Christ in glory. We pray for your promise of a new creation. And pray, come quickly, for our hope is in you. We pray that you would fill our mouths again with a joyful song of your unending love. Help us never to stop proclaiming your faithfulness from one generation to the next, to the next. Come well among us and among all the people of the world. And as you made your home with your people in ancient times, make your home with us today. By your power at work in us, we ask that you would use us to bring gifts, gifts of healing and freedom comfort and hope and peace to share the good news that you walk among us, bringing your own light and your love to the streets of this very community. We pray for our loved ones this morning. We pray for Sally Allen and her family at the death of Barbara. For Jordan and all those who face sudden loss this year. For continued healing for Hannah Schindler. With prayers of gratitude and continued prayers for healing for Shannon. For Don and Rita. For quick recovery from surgery for Brandy and Isaac and Richard. John and Anne and their family. For Mrs. Ruby Jean as she celebrates a milestone birthday. For baby Harris Baker and parents Heather and Kevin. For Ann Shelton and family and friends. For Sarah Brooks. For Rick Prawl. For Tom Preston, for Carolyn Riggins, for Larry Watson, make us aware of those who are hurting and those who are searching, and even when they feel that all is lost, hold their desires and their dreams in your eternal heart. You are our very home. And as the promised day approaches, fill us with joy, the joy of your Holy Spirit, and strengthen us to serve you faithfully. And teach us again to pray the way that Jesus did. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. 
All things in heaven and on earth belong to God, and so God, who is coming in great glory to reveal a new creation, allows us, encourages us to respond, to offer our lives to the Lord in gratitude and joy, in praise and worship. Your offerings will now be received.
Charlie Brown Christmas. That means, you know, yes, like really do make real little Christmas trees. Sorry. So bring him incense, gold, and myrrh. Come shepherd king to own you. The king of kings salvation brings. Let loving hearts enthrone. As you go, in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father and the fellowship of